Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear brothers and sisters. Inshallah, if everybody could uh, kindly share the link so that others could also benefit, if you can send it out by text message, WhatsApp, on your social media pa platforms, uh, whether it's Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, whatever it is, inshallah. So uh, hopefully others can also benefit uh, from, from tonight's lesson, inshallah. So we'll give you a few minutes before uh, we start so that everybody could share the link, inshallah. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم بارك لنا في رجب وشعبان وبلغنا رمضان وأعنا فيه على على الصيام والقيام وغض البصر وتلاوة القرآن ثم أما بعد we praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى the one who created the heavens and the earth, and we send our peace and blessings upon our noble prophet, Sayyiduna Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, upon his blessed family, his loyal companions, his noble wives, his noble children, and all of those who followed after with excellence up until the day of standing. Amina, amina, amin. Inshallah, before we start, I'm going to make a few disclaimers as usual, and that is, this talk tonight, inshallah, is intended for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it purely and sincerely for his sake and to revive the true teachings of the religion of Sayyidina Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And by this, we intend to do service to the best of our abilities, inshallah, to the noble Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, to whom we owe Everything that we have in our lives, we owe it to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam. So this talk is not intended as a hit to any particular individual. Nevertheless, it is intended to speak about an entire generation of a new trend which has appeared over the past few decades uh, in, in, in the way people are reciting the Qur'an Al-Kareem, the Kalamullah, the words of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, and the way that people are engaging in uh, praising the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in their na'ats, in their anashid, whether that is in Urdu, in Arabic, in English, whether it's in Malay, whether it's in whatever language of the world it is in. Regardless, we as Muslims, we have to identify what's going on within our own home. And we must clear that and we must purify that and we must cleanse that because we don't want our illnesses and our wrongs to become a hallmark for Islam and people think, oh well, if that's Islam, it's not really something that 
uh, is attracting me or that younger generations of Muslims see a generation above them behaving in a particular way, reciting the Quran in particular ways, singing nasheeds in particular ways that puts them off from religion altogether and they think, I rather be on the streets, I rather be a gangster, I rather chill, I rather be a normal lad, a normal girl, than to come into religion and mix the dunya with the religion. I rather keep my religion for that day when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives me openings and my beginning of guidance and my tawbah comes and I want to turn to Allah in purity and sincerity. I don't want to mix the dirt and the filth of the dunya of, uh, of, of uh, rap songs, of uh, pop stars, of Bollywood and Hollywood. I don't want to mix all of that with religion. So my dear brothers and sisters, this today inshallah is nasiha. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said this entire religion is nasiha. And the, uh, uh, so therefore this is nasiha and it's sincere advice. But at the same time, we have to look at those points. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he was, he was jamal, he was beauty. But at the same time, he was Jalal also, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Our teacher, Sheikh Muhammad Samir al-Nas, hafizahullahu ta'ala, the Allama to sham the, one of the greatest scholars of Damascus, he says, we oftentimes overlook and try to forget and, 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 and pretend that it doesn't exist. But the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, had a Jalal to him. He had might to him, which kept this, which has really kept this religion going for 1400 years because we, ha we love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but at the same time, we fear him. And how can that be possible that you love somebody so much, but at the same time, you fear that person? The scholars have said, you fear that you don't want to upset them. You fear that they become angry or upset with something that you do, and you don't want that as a lover. So all of us who we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that he increases us, and gives us pure, sincere love for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we have to also be remembering that I can't upset him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I can't anger him Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi Wasallam. And they are very, very clear points. Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he would be at home, he would sit with us, speak with us, smile and laugh, and he would be so jolly. And when the time for prayer came, كَأَنَّنَا لَا نَعْرِفُهُ وَلَا يَعْرِفُنَا when the time for prayer came, it was as if we didn't know who this person was and nor did he know who we were. Why? Because now it's the time which is not for people. This time is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This time is for worship unto Allah azza wa jal. And his worship requires that we disconnect and detach ourselves from everybody and everything. And we focus with all of our energy towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this talk tonight, there's no name droppings, no name mentionings, and it's nasiha inshallah for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I ask Allah to make it purely and sincerely for his sake subhanahu wa ta'ala. My dear brothers and sisters, the people who know me uh, and who've, who've attended classes, who've les listened to my lessons and so on, they, they can very, very uh, clearly say that I'm not a judge judgmental p person. I'm not somebody who will look at somebody and say, you know what, you're going to Jahannam or something, with billah. I'm not one of those people and people who have heard my talks over the years, people who have personally interacted with me, whether it's even people from my own family, with my relatives, my friends, people, students who come and I study with them, alongside them, they will tell you I'm not a judgmental pe person. And this wasn't from my tarbiyah to be judgmental of people for, for, the, for, the, for the scholars at whose feet I sat and I was honored to pick up their shoes. They were from a lineage of a people who even if they saw a student who walked into their class and he had no beard on his face, i.e. he was clean shaven, they would put that person ahead of them and make him lead the prayer. And that was the great Imam Muhammad Badruddin al-Hassani radiallahu anhu, who is my great grandfather in knowledge from the scholars of Asham. So he taught us not to be judgmental of anybody. And the story of the prostitutes to him, he used to send money. And anyone that he sent money to would come back to him and make tawbah and become from the friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My dear brothers and sisters, I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never makes me judgmental till I leave this world. And 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the only judge of people's intentions inside their hearts. But saying that, my dear brothers and sisters, we can't, myself and yourselves and anybody out there, whether we're Quran reciters or Nasheed singers, we can't say to people, brother, you don't know what's in my heart. Sister, you don't know what's in my heart. We can't say that. Why? In, uh, in, in the Bukhari, uh, in Sahih al-Bukhari, Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he said, in the time, so he said this after the passing of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa from this world. Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he said, in the days of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, people used to be caught out through revelation. Listen to this, my dear brothers and sisters, carefully. Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu said, people used to be caught out through revelation in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, i.e. those who are munafiqs, verses of the Quran would be revealed, exposing them, exposing their deeds, exposing what they would say in Surah Al-Hujurat and in other surahs of the Quran. What did he say next? He said, now we don't have revelation. We don't know through revelation what the inner state of people is. So what did he say? He said, therefore, we will judge a people by their apparent actions. If their apparent actions are upon the Sharia, they are upon decency and good akhlaq and the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, marhaba, we accept that. If it is otherwise, i.e. if they are dubious in their actions, if they are indecent in their ways, if they have left the Sirat Al-Mustaqeem, the straight path that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam clearly uh, uh, created for us, then we will, we will not take them on. We will not accept them. Listen to what he says next. He said, and even if they tell us, our insides are pure. My dear brothers and sisters, I and everybody out there, all Quran reciters and all Nasheed singers, we shouldn't deceive ourselves in saying to people, you don't know what's in my heart. You don't know what's in my heart. Don't look at my outer actions. Don't judge a book by its cover. But Sayyidina Umar is telling you that. Judge the book by its cover. And the ulama of Aqeedah, have a clear rule. نَحْكُمُ بِالظَّوَاهِرُ وَاللَّهُ يَتَوَلَّ السَّرَائِرُ We judge by the apparent and Allah takes care of what's in inside the person's heart. That's nothing to do with us. My dear brothers and sisters, we should not fall for this deception of the shaitan who makes us uh, play these games with ourselves first and foremost and then with people. We should be honest and truthful with ourselves. We shouldn't lie to ourselves. Like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to the companion who came to ask, what's goodness? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, matma'annat ilayhi al-qalb. Goodness is what you find tranquility and peace in. And what's the opposite of that? What's al-ism? What's sin? What's disobedience? What's wrong? He said, wrong is that which, uh, which agitates you inside of yourself. Agitates you inside yourself. And you really dislike and you hate for anybody to work that out or see that or know that. My dear brothers and sisters, this is a very, very important point in being honest with ourselves. I as a speaker, I as a Quran reciter, I as a Nasheed singer, I shouldn't live a double life. I shouldn't live a life in public on the stage, in front of people, and then behind the scenes, I live a different life. That's not from the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. My dear brothers and sisters, look, this is why I said initially, there's people out there, there's people out there, and so many young people have said it to me. They said, Shaykh, we're not really religious people, but we really despise religious people, especially the young Quran reciters and the Nasheed singers. And even some young imams and quote-unquote scholars, we despise them. I say, why? They say, because they live double lives. What does that mean they live double lives? They'll go to the masjid and sing a nath, do a talk, recite the Quran. But they're doing everything else the same as us. They're clubbing, they're checking out girls, they're having uh, uh, hidden relationships, they're going on their holidays in Dubai and doing all sorts, and so on and so forth. We despise them because we may be sinful. We may be doing wrong. We may be doing the same as them. But you know, we've got some decency. 
that we don't use the religion for our wrongs. We've got some haya that we don't use the religion for our shahwa, for our lowly desires. Look, they say to me, we're bad, we do wrong. We commit all the sins under the sun. But the one thing that we don't do is commit those sins in the name of religion. That's a bit of decency, which is enormous. Because Allah said in the Quran, وَمَن يُعَظِّمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ And those who magnify the signs of Allah, then that truly is a sign of the piety of, uh, of their hearts, of the piety of hearts. So these people, they say, look, we, we commit sins, we do wrong. We chill out, we go, we do whatever. But we don't mix it with religion. Why are these nasheed people and even Quran reciters, and I'm not just speaking about the UK, I'm speaking about people from all over the world. Alhamdulillah, I've traveled far and wide, and I've seen the culture all across the world. But that doesn't make it correct, and it, that doesn't make it real. Look, there was munafiqs in Madinatul Munawwara. Do we follow their way? Do we say, mashallah, they were pious people, we're going to kiss their hands and feet? They were munafiqs. Yet they had the opportunity of living in Madinatul Munawwara. There was munafiqs and kafirs living in Makkah al Mukarramah. That doesn't make them any good. If this culture has spread across the world and people in Syria are doing it, in Yemen are doing it, in Malaysia they're doing it, Indonesia they're doing it, in Pakistan and India they're doing it, in Africa they're doing it, in, 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 in England, in the UK, in the US, if they're doing it all over, my dear brothers and sisters, it doesn't make it correct. It doesn't justify that people can go on and say, that's fine, I'm going to do this. So it's very, very important. We do not use religion for, for, to cover up our sins. You know, my teacher Mufti Sahib, he said to me, he said, you know, if somebody commits a sin, that's wrong. But we're all sinners, people commit sins. And the person who after committing the sin is remorseful, is sorry, sheds tears. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves that person. But then he said, on the other hand, if there's a person who commits a sin and then pretends, I didn't do anything wrong, that's all fine, that's all good. He said, that's the most despised and hated of people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because Allah said in the Quran, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُ اتَّقِ اللَّهَ أَخَذَتْهُ الْعِزَّةُ بِالْإِثْمِ فَحَسْبُهُ جَهَنَّمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, and when it said to them, fear Allah, look what are you doing? You're singing nasheeds and you're going clubbing. You're singing nasheeds and you're chatting up girls on social media. You're singing nasheeds. You're singing na'at of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya Allah. You're singing na'at of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whilst you're in the bath. You're on your bed in your pajamas. What are you doing? When it's said to them, Ittaqillah, fear Allah. You want to fulfill your shahwa? Go and do it with the dunya. Don't use the religion for it. My dear brothers and sisters, we're all sinful people. On the day of judgment, what do we have hope in? We have hope in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. But if we even exploit him, fidahu abi wa ummi, if we even use him for our shahawat, if we even use him for our lowly desires, then who will we be able to turn to? My dear brothers and sisters, I beg you and I ask you, just think about what are you doing? Don't use the religion. Allah said, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُ اتَّقِ اللَّهِ When it said to them, fear Allah. You're chatting up girls and you're singing the sheets like Bollywood, uh, like Bollywood songs. You're, you're making body gestures as if you're chatting up a girl. You're making body gestures as if you're about to do whatever. When it said to them, Ittaqillah, fear Allah. Akhazatul izzatu bin ism. They take pride in their sin. Say, bro, you don't know what's in my heart. Ya Latif, Ya Allah. You don't know what's in my heart. For God's sake, don't let the de shaitan deceive you. My dear brothers and sisters, beautiful voice is a ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A beautiful voice is a ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't waste this ni'mah. One day the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
passed by one of his companions who was standing in namaz in salah and he was reciting Quran. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam listened to him and then he went and when he met him next he said I heard your recitation of the Quran and it was beautiful. لَقَدْ أُوتِيْتَ مِزْمَارًا مِنْ مَزَامِيرِ آلِ Dawood. It's as if you were given a trumpet from the trumpets of the family of Dawood alayhi salam. i.e. you have a beautiful voice. What did he say to the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He said, Ya Rasul Allah, if I knew that you were listening, لَحَبَّرْتُهُ تَحْبِيرًا I would have beautified it even more. My dear brothers and sisters, my brothers in public, my sisters in private. And that's another topic altogether. I'm not saying that sisters should be reciting Quran out aloud in gatherings amongst men or nasheeds. This is, this is not allowed. This is not allowed in our religion. I'm saying to them if they are doing it in private. But my dear brothers in particular, you've got these beautiful voices. Who are you trying to impress? Who are you trying to impress with, with your voices? If you are trying to make a presentation to Sayyidul Mursaleen, Imamul Muttaqeen, Fakhrul Kainat, Sayyidul Sadat, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Sallam, then you should be reciting with beautiful voices and your hearts will be broken. Your eyes will be shedding tears. My brothers and sisters, enough is enough. The red line has pa been passed too many a time. And I'm seriously worried about the younger generation of children who are now seeing these quote-unquote Quran reciters, nasheed artists who are gaining fame on social media because of their voices, because of their recitations of the Quran, because of their nasheeds and nats. They are gaining social media uh, fame. But then where is that ta fame taking them? It's taking them to destruction. It's taking them to halak. And they shouldn't think, you know, a lot of people, my dear brothers, this is, a lot of people, they say, they say, and look, I'm not speaking because I'm bitter. I'm going to make this very, very clear. I don't want people trolling and saying all sorts. Listen to what I'm saying. And I'm not speaking on my behalf. Don't listen to me if I speak on my behalf. I speak on behalf. I say Allah said and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam said. I'm not bitter about anything. Alhamdulillah, Allah has given me an opportunity and I've traveled the world. Allah has given me an opportunity and I'm able to sit and teach. Alhamdulillah, I'm not bitter about anything. So I'm not here to take your fame from you. Because I know there's people out there who'll say, ah, oh, these scholars, they can't take it. We've become more famous than them. Just because they can't get nobody in their gatherings, they start attacking us. That's not the case at all. I've been back for many, many years. Over a decade, I've been back now. I've never spoken about this topic in this particular way so public. And those who know me in private, they know me. And I've not attended any, any of these types of not events, even though I've been invited. So I'm not bitter about anything. I'm trying to give sincere nasiha for the sake of generations who are to come. Because if we don't set the, 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 the track straight again, then what's going to come is going to be much worse than what we are seeing now. So we have young nasheed people and Quran reciters of this new generation saying, oh wow, we attract more young people than you. So we're doing a greater service to the religion than you. So don't be jealous of us if we're singing like this and we're dressed like this and we make motions like this and we make voices like this. Didn't you hear what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the Hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi Wasallam, what did he say in the Hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari? He said, وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يُؤَيِّدُ هَذَا الدِّينَ بِالرَّجُلِ الْفَاجِرِ Ya Latif. وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يُؤَيِّدُ هَذَا الدِّينَ بِالرَّجُلِ الْفَاجِرِ The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, And Allah, if He wants, gives support and assistance to this religion, 
through a fajr person. What does that mean? What's a fajr? A grave transgressor and sinner. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala perhaps can use him too. When did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa say this? He was in one of the battles and there was one man, he was fighting the most, uh, the, the most strongest of fight. He was on the side of the Muslims and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, you know this person, he's from the people of the fire. And the Sahaba were shocked. They got scared. They said, Ya Rasulullah, he's, he, he fought the most. And the Prophet ﷺ said, he's from the people of the fire. And he was on the side of the Muslims. This wasn't an army of Salahuddin or somebody. This was the army of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ said, he's going to be from the people of the fire. And the Sahaba said, what did we see? At the end of the battle, this man was so injured, he was in so much pain, what did he do? He committed suicide and he killed himself. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, you guys were surprised at what I said. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he wants, he will use a transgressor and a fajr to support his religion. It's, it shouldn't be a matter of boasting. I've done better for the religion than anybody else. My dear brothers and sisters, that's what the munafiqs used to say in Medina. And what did Allah say in Surah Al-Hujurat? يَمُنُّونَ عَلَيْكَ أَنْ أَسْلَمُوا قُلْ لَا تَمُنُّوا عَلَيَّ إِسْلَامَكُمْ بَلِ اللَّهُ يَمُنُّوا عَلَيْكُمْ أَنْ هَدَاكُمْ لِلْإِيمَانِ They used to, يَمُنُّونَ عَلَيْكَ أَنْ أَسْلَمُوا Allah said to the Prophet ﷺ, they will be showing you a favor that we accepted Islam. بَرَا كَمْ كِتَانِ أَسَا مُسْلِمَانُوا إِجِيَا We've become Muslim, we've done you a favor. Allah said, قُلْ لَا تَمُنُّوا عَلَيَّ إِسْلَامَكُمْ Don't do me no favors by accepting Islam. بَلِ اللَّهُ يَمُنُّوا عَلَيْكُمْ أَنْ هَدَاكُمْ لِلْإِيمَانِ But rather it is Allah who does you a favor by guiding you. Don't say, these scholars, they don't have nobody in their gatherings. Just because we can get people together, they are jealous of us. They're not jealous of you. They fear for you and they fear for this religion. Why? الْأَنْبِيَاءُ The scholars, they are the heirs of the prophets. And Allah said, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءُ It is only the truly, rightly guided scholars who truly fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm not claiming to be from the scholars. I'm not claiming and I've never made this claim to be from the scholars. But alhamdulillah, Allah gave me the honor to pick up the shoes of the scholars, to kiss their shoes, to sit in their feet for, 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 for a period of time. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he never deprived me or any of you from being in the presence of the truly rightly guided scholars who are indeed the awliya Allah as Imam al-Shafi'i radiallahu an said إِن لَمْ يَكُنِ الْعُلَمَاءُ أَوْلِيَاءَ لِلَّهِ فَلَيْسَ لِلَّهِ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلِي He said if the truly rightly guided scholars are not from the friends of Allah then there is nobody who is from the friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Don't put up this front that we've got more people than you and you're jealous of us there will be prophets who come on the day of judgment, they'll have one person or two people with them. Are you going to say, oh, we've got more people than you? Calm down. Calm down. Don't let all of these negative vibes get to you. Think what you're doing. So this culture that has now spread in the UK, it's in other countries too, but home, that's where we should start from. And that's the UK. This culture that has spread, Young people start to sing nasheeds and nats because they've got beautiful voices, marhaba. Then they set up Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat accounts. Fine. If you wish, do that. If you wish so, then do that. Some, somebody might say to you, oh, Sheikh, you've got a very big uh, page. When did, I, when did I open my page? The day that I landed from Syria and I came back to the UK, did I open my page then? No. I was Khatib in Lausanne's mosque, I didn't have a page. I set up the City of Knowledge Academy, I didn't have a page. When I saw the need for Sunni Islam to have a page that propagates the love of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the true teachings of the Ahlul Sunnah Wal Jama'ah, that's when I set it up. And this page, it, I, I don't have free control over it. Alhamdulillah, the reins of this page 
are in the hands of the great awliya and ulama of this ummah who are my teachers. And in Madinatul Munawwara, my teacher, the deputy head of Fathul Islami, in Madinatul Munawwara, Sheikh Muhammad Khair Tarshan, he said to me, he said, we're watching you minute by minute, moment by moment. I said to him, if I have the sight of people like you over me, minute by minute, then Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And not only the scholars in Syria, my teacher Mufti Saab, from the day that I've come back from Syria, I, I started reciting Quran again to him. I started studying the books of fiqh with him. And I visit him every so often. And why? Because we always need to stay in the company of those who are older than us and take from their blessings and take from their teachings. I'm not a person who's just free. I'm not a person who's just free. My dear brothers and sisters, you've set up your account. Who, who are, who's holding your reins? And don't be so confident that you think I can hold my own reins. It's impossible. The nafs will get to you. The shaitan will get to you. Your lowly desires will play with you. And we're living in such a sexualized society. And I'm going to be blatant. I'm going to be clear. It's so difficult. You know, if you were living in a real world, walking up and down the streets and going to work and being in the office, it's so difficult for people. I know people, students who come to the beginning of guidance who've got degrees, but they didn't pursue their careers. They ended up Amazon drivers and security guards. I said to him, why are you doing that? He said, because we don't want to be in the office world. Because it's so sexualized, we don't want to be in there. We don't want to lose our Iman. We'd rather take less payment as a security guard, Amazon driver, than to lose our Iman in the office. My dear brothers and sisters, that's in the real world. Imagine in the virtual world, people sitting on their laptops, on their mobile phones, one o'clock at night, two o'clock at night, in their beds, in their pajamas, for God's sake. What are you doing? Not of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How can you sing that? How can you recite that like that? Have some haya. Would you wake up in front of your mom and dad at one o'clock and two o'clock in your pajamas and go and speak to them like that? You dress up honorably, respectfully. Would you speak to your teachers? Would you go to your teacher's house in your pajamas at one o'clock at night? And speak to that, your teacher like that. Wake up! You, you're reciting the Quran, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And cases that have come out worldwide of people with beautiful voices, but they've ended up messing up their careers because they're chatting to girls, because they're having affairs, because they're clubbing and doing all sorts. For God's sake, don't do it in the name of the religion. The words of Allah. Kalamullah. Reciting a nut to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Please, wake up. Young people, they become famous. The Muslims love their voices. Their emo even their emotions, they have beautiful emotions and beautiful uh, uh, voices. And the Muslims encourage them. But then they take advantage of that encouragement. And one of the major reasons for that advantage is this one thing that's missing. They've got nobody on their heads. I'm going to tell you, when I was a student with my teacher Mufti Saab, before I went to Syria, this is in the 90s. Mufti Saab, he, he, he told me, and my friend Hafiz Nisar from Oxford, he told us of a particular group of students <coughs> who are around. Mufti Saab said, they're knowledgeable. They've studied knowledge. They've read a lot of books. But Mufti Saab said to us, but they are yatim. What are they? Yatim. <clears throat> Mufti Saab said they are yatim. We said, Staji, why? 
He said, because they've got nobody on top of their head. They feel we're, we're superstars all by ourselves. They don't feel a sense of pressure on top of their heads that we've got a teacher above us. We've got a ustad above us. We've got a maulana uh, above us. We've got somebody older above our heads who's going to keep us straight. If we make a mistake this way or that way, he's going to grip us. He's going to grab us. Say, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be saying that. You shouldn't be sitting with these people, etc., etc. That's what's seriously missing. I'm not saying this because I want not people to come to me and say, oh, we've become his students. No, 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 no. Understand the point. Don't let the shaitan take from your mind. Because I know there's going to be people listening to this today and the shaitan is going to be giving them all sorts of ideas. Oh, oh now he wants the not people to become his students. No, I don't want you to become my students. I want you to go and find somebody who will guide you, give you guidance. Find somebody who you can look up to. Find somebody of righteousness and piety and a hal, a state with the Prophet wasallam, with flowing tears from the eyes. So that's something, that's a major thing that's missing. That these young people don't have somebody above them, so hence they are spiritually yatim. Whereas if they studied na'ats, nasheeds, and even making uh, reciting Quran, tilawat in, in gatherings, if they had a teacher on their head, they'd be pressurized seriously. My teacher Mufti Saab, every year I used to come back from Syria, you know what he used to ask me? He used to say, Af Saab, manzil na kya alne? Af Saab, how's your Quran revision? How's your Quran revision? And you know what he said to me? He said to me, he said to me, I know when students start studying books, they don't get too much time to revise their Quran. I don't want you to neglect it and forget it. Every single year, he used to say that to me. And when I came back from Syria, the first thing that I done, Alhamdulillah, that I recite, I went to his house and I recited Quran to him. And that's when he was happy with me. I recited Quran to him. See, I had somebody on top of me. Otherwise, I could have forgot it because I was engaged in my other studies. Young people need a teacher on their head who's guiding them. Look, I'll give you an example. And this is, I'm only saying this because I'm heartbroken. And there's people out there who come and tell me. I've been up and down the UK. And believe me, I'm not going to say names. I'm not going to mention names and I can. But what's the point? I'm not here to expose people. I'm not here to make a mockery and judge people. I'm giving broad guidelines as to how we can better ourselves. Believe me, the, the parents of so many famous nasheed artists, not singers, have come to me. Whilst I've been traveling up and down this country, and they've said, we're really worried about our son. And I said, what? MashaAllah, he recites so beautifully. They say, yeah, in front of people, he can recite very nicely. He has a beautiful voice, he has good talent, but he's a rebel at home. He doesn't listen to us. He's, he's bad-mouthed, he's bad-mannered, and he comes back at night, one, two o'clock at night. We don't know where he's been. And then he gives us excuse, I've been uh, revising and rehearsing knots in the sheets. But they don't believe him. Parents have come to me in tears. I'm not joking. Parents have come to me in tears saying, please, can you speak to our son? He doesn't listen to us at home. He's disrespectful with us. My dear brothers and sisters, who are we doing all of this for? We shouldn't mix the dunya with our akhirah because you know the two, they don't mix. It's not like a diluted drink. You can put this into that and you can just mix it up. It doesn't work. You know, religion, it exposes the dunya. We ask Allah for afiyah. We ask Allah for well-being. You know, religion, the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ هَذَا الدِّينَ مَتِينٌ فَأَوْغِلُوا فِيهِ بِالْرِفْقِ He said, indeed, this religion is very mighty and strong. So, come through it with ease. Don't bash your way through it. Don't bring your dunya to it because you know the deen, it's going to throw out the dunya. And one day or the other, it will expose and we don't want that for anybody out there. My dear brothers and sisters, this nasheed and this even Quran reciting culture. Look, 
people out there are sitting in in gyms reciting nats and nasheeds sitting in barber shops singing nats and nasheeds sitting sitting in super super cars uh, driving up and down singing nasheeds and nats uh, and even quran and this you know in quran is meant to be recited in the most respectful of ways the most honorable and dignified of ways and likewise the nat of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam what sense does it make like a Bollywood star uh, in, in, in some uh, Ferrari that's like 90k driving up and down the motorway blasting a nasheed and a naat? Like what's the difference between that and Bollywood? See, that's what the people who are quote-unquote not practicing and quote-unquote who would term themselves are not so religious. They look at this religious folk and think, bloody hell, you guys have taking it to the lowest of the low. Just take it from what they're saying. That's shameful. My dear brothers and sisters, there's an etiquette of reciting the Quran. That's number one. There's an etiquette of, of, of maintaining the recite. There's an etiquette of reciting the Quran and etiquette of reciting the Na'at of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi wa sallam. Etiquette in the way we articulate an etiquette of our states. How we perform, how we present, how we perform and how we present. There's an etiquette to that. So we have to be very careful of what we're doing. And you know, there'll be people who listen to all of this. They say, you know what, Sheikh, what you're saying is the truth. But they'll still go and promote these people. We have to stop promoting them. Why? Not because I want the fame. Because we need to take the fame away from them. So that the Muslims don't think what they're doing is right. We've Muslims encouraged them and liked them and followed them. Why? Because of their beautiful voices and the, the beautiful words that they were reciting. But all of this tarnishing that's going on on the side of it. It's not worth Muslims following these people. So, a principle, an, another principle that we have to really ingrain into our minds and hearts is what? Faith before friends. Faith before friends. And I'm going to recite that line of <clears throat> Mawlana Ilyas Qadri Hafizahullah Ta'ala uh, in the famous Nat Madani Madine Wale. And when my grandfather, Rahmatullah Ali, he used to hear this line he used to cry and what's that he said mere sab aziz chute mere sab yaar bhi to rute he said all of my relatives they left me mere sab yaar bhi to rute and my friends they got upset with me kabhi tum na rute jana madani madine wale but all i want all i want oh custodian of madina all i want is that you don't get upset with me and you don't abandon me, and that you don't leave me. My dear brothers and sisters, our faith must be above our friends. If somebody's doing wrong, it's your job, it's my job, it's everybody's job to give them nasiha, to give them sincere advice, and not to promote them in the wrong that they are doing. Look, if I do wrong and I ask Allah for while being an afia and savior, alhamdulillah, I know there's people around me who'll stop me, who'll tell me, don't do this. This is wrong. Fear Allah in this. Rectify yourself. Don't put this out. Don't put this up. I have this, these conversations every single day. And the people who know me and know who are the people around me are, they know of that. My dear brothers and sisters, don't give in to the, to the deception of the shaitan, to the deception of the lowly nafs. These, if, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you fame, what are you going to do with that fame? Look, my grandfather, Rahmatullahi Ali, he came from a very, very poor family. He said to me in tears, he said, the day that my father passed away, i.e. my great-grandfather, he said, the day that my father passed away, we didn't have anything in our homes to put him on and carry him to the graveyard. That's how poor we were. And my grandfather was blind. So was his brother and so was his sister. My grandfather said, then in my teens, I left from home 
to go and study this religion. I memorized the Quran, I studied the sciences of Islam. Then I came back to our lands. I, begin to, I began to teach the Quran and teach people their religion. And then he said, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enriched me such that I've got more wealth than all of the people of my family. He said that was because of the barakah of the Quran al kareem My dear brothers and sisters, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us honor, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us wealth, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us fame, that can either be a blessing or it can end up being punishment. It's, it's a blessing when we use it in the right way. It's a blessing and we were better without it if it ends up becoming punishment for us. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the famous hadith, which is an extremely scary hadith, extremely scary. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said on the day of judgment, uh, uh, different types of people will be brought forth and one of them is a Quran reciter. And Allah will say to him, why did you recite the Quran? He'll say, oh Allah, I recited for your sake. Allah will say, kazabta, you lying. You didn't do it for my sake. You did it so that people <coughs> would celebrate you. So that people would say, look how beautiful of a Quran reciter he is. Look how, <coughs> uh, 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 how he beautifies his voice. How amazing he recites. That's why you did it. And people celebrated you. My dear brothers and sisters, if people of the world are celebrating us, that's scary. We should fear and turn to Allah in repentance and cry before him and say, Oh Allah, if I'm being given my reward in this world, then help me, save me. Allah will say to that Quran reciter, Kazabta, you're lying. You did it so that people would celebrate you and they celebrated you. You got your fame, you got your game, you got your wealth in the world. There's nothing here for you. Take him to the fire. My dear brothers and sisters, this fame, if it goes against us, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? My teachers, all of them, they used to scare us. They used to scare us from uh, attending gatherings and sitting on stages before we completed our studies. Before we completed our studies. When I came back from Syria, there was people saying, uh, there were people who came to my father and to my uncle and they said we want to call Aslam Allama and he's and, and, and he's saying no you can't call me that we're saying to him you don't have to call yourself we will make you Allama and my father my uncle rang my father and told him and one day I was sitting with my father and he said to me he said this is what your uncle said that people are saying we want to make him Allama we want to call him Allama which means a very big, gigantic scholar. And he's, not, and he's not taking it. And I looked at my certificate that was on the wall. And I said to my father, look at the name of Sheikh Abdul Razak Al-Halabi. Does it say Allama before his name? Or does it say Sheikh Abdul Razak Al-Halabi? And my father didn't say anything after that. My teachers in Syria, they would say, don't sit on stages. And don't attend. Don't be at the front of gatherings before you have completed your studies because the shaitan will take you from means and ways that don't even cross your mind when i came back from syria and i told my teacher mufti sahab he said he said to me and that's exactly what my, our teachers used to tell us also and he re uh, uh, emphasized that upon me also my dear brothers and sisters if I, if somebody's got a beautiful voice whether with quran whether with nasheed that doesn't give them an automatic certificate to go and start sitting on stages. Because that sitting on the stage without having that person's reins in the hands of somebody righteous and pious and scholarly and honorable and dignified and an elder is going to destroy that person. And how many of the people who are young ended up sitting on stages and then they thought they were bigger than what they actually are? And what happened to them? What happened to them? They were destroyed by the dunya. And the dunya is so evil and it's so strong. It's taken out the toughest of people. We're still weak people. It's taken out the toughest of people. So don't think you can get away with it. Don't think you're immune. Don't think you're protected. It's like, I'll give you an example. 
Sometimes I ask young people, It's like sometimes I ask young people, are you married? And they say, Sheikh, no, alhamdulillah, I'm fine. I don't need to get married. I don't need marriage. I say to them, look, why are you so overconfident about yourself? When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam doesn't have this much confidence in you, how can you have so much confidence in yourself? And they say, like, what do you mean, Sheikh? I say to them, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he passed by a group of young people and he said, Ya ma'ashar al-shabaab, man istata'a minkum al-ba'ata fal yatazawwaj. Oh young men, any one of you who is able to get married, then he should get married. Wa man lam yastati' fa'alayhi bis-sawm. And those of you who cannot get married, then you should be fasting. I say to them, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, either you're married or you're fasting. There's no third way about it. There's no, oh, I don't need to get married. I'm fine. My desires are under control. Like, how do you have all this confidence about yourself? That your desires are under control. Don't get overconfident about yourselves. Especially if you don't have a teacher to look up to. If you don't have an elder to look up to. If you don't have a true person of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to look up to and that you sit with and you take counsel from and you take advice from don't think you can walk this path all alone ma, ma aflaha man aflaha illa bi suhbati man aflah the scholars have said ma aflaha man aflah those who succeeded did not succeed illa bi suhbati man aflah except through the company of those who succeeded what does that mean? Imam Abu Hanifa radiallahu anhu, he used to have 40 mujtahid in his gathering. Our teacher, Sheikh Abdul Razak al-Halabi rahmatullahi I saw with my own eyes when he used to teach the hashi of Imam Ibn Abidin radiallahu an, the senior teachers of Fathul Islami would be sitting there. And I used to think all of these teachers who are sitting for this lesson, they are great scholars in their own respect, but yet they still come and sit with Sheikh Abdul Razak. And many of them accompanied him for 40 years, even though they were scholars themselves. Why? Because we can never give up on sitting with the righteous people of Allah and the scholars. And if we do, you know what that means? That means I've got too much confidence in myself. That means I think I'm immune from getting caught up in chatting up girls and uh, in, in, in all sorts of wrongs that are going on in society. My dear brothers and sisters, مَا أَفْلَحَ مَنْ أَفْلَحَ إِلَّا بِصُحْبَةِ مَنْ أَفْلَحَ Nobody succeeded except those who kept the company of those who succeeded. So this culture that has now prevailed of young people hitting the stages, becoming famous, what's made them famous? It's the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They should appreciate that. They should be grateful for that. They should use that ni'mah in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But unfortunately, in so many cases, what's happening? They are using it for their own advantage. Either for their shahwa, their lowly desires. Or uh, shahwa of sexual shahwa. Or the shahwa of fame. Or the shahwa of wealth. All of these are shahwat. Allah said in the Quran, زُيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ حُبُّ الشَّهَوَاتِ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ وَالْبَنِينَ وَالْقَرَاطِيرِ الْمُقَنْطَرَةِ مِنَ الذَّهَبِ وَالْفِضَّةِ وَالْخَيْلِ الْمُسَوَّمَةِ وَالْأَنْعَامِ وَالْحَرْثِ ذَلِكَ مَتَاعُ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a list زُيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ حُبُّ الشَّهَوَاتِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said حُبُّ الشَّهَوَاتِ Love of lowly desires has been decorated for people I'm from people, you're from people, we're all from people. We're not excluded from this verse. We're all included in this verse. Which means, all the list of shahawat that Allah mentions, they've all been decorated and adorned for all of us. What's going to protect us from them? My dear brothers and sisters, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you fame through his religion, through reciting his kalam, the Quran, through reciting nats for the Prophet وسلم, and then we end up, or you, uh, then people end up using that for their personal advantage, then what face will they come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with? 
It's like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, man, man kathaba aliyya mutaammidan fal yatabawwa' maqadahu min al-nar. Anybody who, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, anybody who lies on my behalf and says, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whilst he didn't say, makes up, fabricates a statement and says, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the Prophet said, then that person should take his position and seat in the fire of hell. Why? Because this person is attributing to the Prophet ﷺ that which is not from him ﷺ. Imagine the one who is using words with which the Prophet ﷺ should be honored, should be respected, using those words when the person starts to use them for his own desires, to justify his own desires, to justify the desires, the sexual desires, financial desires, fame desires. What's going to happen to that person? My dear brothers and sisters, this culture, we need to move away from it. Seriously. You know, Bollywood dancing while singing not. My body is cringing. I don't know what to say. You know what Allah says in the Quran? Allah says, وَتُعَزِّرُوهُ وَتُوَقِّرُوهُ Allah said, Honor him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Venerate him, respect him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What does that mean? That means respecting his person, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That means respecting the Quran that was revealed to him. Respecting the hadith that he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we know Imam Malik, Imam Dar al-Hijra, radiyallahu an, his adab for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How was his adab? In Medina al Munawwara, he never wore shoes. He never wore sandals. In Medina al Munawwara, he never rode an animal. In Medina al Munawwara, he never relieved himself. He would go far out. Why? In honor of the one who resides in Medina sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what did Imam Malik radiyallahu an say? Imam Malik radiyallahu an said, when Allah said in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu la tarfa'u aswatakum fawqa sawtin nabi wa la tajharu lahu bil qawli ka jahri ba'dikum li ba'din an tahbata a'malukum wa antum wa antum la tashuroon. Allah said, O oh, believing people, don't raise your voices above the voice of the Prophet sallallahu And don't shout out to him the way you shout out to each other. And That perhaps your actions will all become null whilst you don't even realize. Imam Malik radiallahu anh said, this verse is applicable during his blessed lifetime and after his passing from this world, whilst his hadith is recited. Which means, when hadith of the Prophet ﷺ is recited, then the same adab is required, that people don't raise their voices above that voice, that people don't shout out and call out the way they shout out and call out to each other. My dear brothers and sisters, tell me, this not culture, and even Quran culture, that has prevailed now in our communities, in our masajid of jumping up and down and being in this quote-unquote ecstatic party mode. Where has this come from? And please don't say to me this is wajd. Don't deceive yourselves. Don't let the shaitan to deceive you and say this is wajd. Please don't say that. You know why? Look, this is the terminology of the great awliya Allah. We shouldn't be using the terminology of the great awliya Allah. We don't have right to do that. If, we, if we're not praying our five daily prayers in jama'ah, how can we use the terminology of the awliya Allah? If we are not memorizing the Quran, reciting the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, honoring and respecting our parents, fulfilling all of our duties, our fara'id, our nawafil, how can we then say we've got wajd? So that, does that mean that our people, they are given wajd without any of those worships 
Yet the awliya Allah had to strive through worship after worship, obligatory and voluntary, and go out of their way and stand, stand in the depths of their night before they are given wajd. And we say we've given it free of charge. Wake up. Don't be deceived by the shaitan. Don't deceive yourselves. Say we've got wajd. Don't make up fairy, fairy stories. People reciting in an in a, in a unbefitting manner. So if the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, we're not allowed to raise our voices above it, tell me, what does the word na'at mean? The word na'at means description. The word na'at means description. Whose description? The description of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And how would his sahaba radiallahu anhum describe him? And who were his sahaba radiallahu anhum who described him? Who were they who described him? The scholars have said, the scholars have said, the sahaba in the shama'il of Imam Tirmidhi radiallahu an, the sahaba who described the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa they were the young ones. They were the young children, Sayyidina Ali, Sayyidina al-Hasan, his son Sayyidina al-Hasan, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar, Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik, these young companions. We never have a narration Sayyidina Abu Bakr described the Prophet ﷺ. We never have a, a, a narration of Sayyidina Umar or, or the likes of these elder companions in age describing the Prophet ﷺ. Why? Because Sayyidina Amr ibn al-As radiallahu an, what did he say? He said, مَا مَلَأْتُ عَيْنِي مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ مُنْذُ أَنْ أَسْلَمْتُ He said, I never picked up my eyes and raised them towards the noble countenance of the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم from the day I accepted Islam. What does that mean? His majesty, his greatness, his beauty. The Sahaba had haya in front of it. They were shy before him. They were respectful. They didn't raise their eyes. They didn't fill their eyes and see him. They, they didn't satiate their eyes by seeing him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because of his majesty, because of his greatness. My dear brothers and sisters, the scholars have said, recite the na'at, the description of the one who is being described. Both have the same ruling. What does that mean? Both have the same ruling. What does that mean? Both have the same ruling. The way you would be in the presence of the one who, who is being described, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that's how you should be whilst his description is being recited. And that's how the re reciter of the description should be. My dear brothers and sisters, we really need to wake up. We need to wake up. Wake up. Don't let our shahawat and our desires deceive us and try to mix religion with, with our personal desires. We need to make tawbah from this. We need to turn back to Allah from this. We need to break down before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, Allah, I'm sorry. I've done it the wrong way. Guide me, help me. You know, our teacher, Sheikh Fawaz, he used to say to us, they say, you know, when you finish from, from your studies and you graduate, you'll be in a state. You'll feel, I'm lost in this big world. He said that to us. He said, you'll feel that you're lost in this big world. He used, he used to say to us, turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, Allahumma inni ha'irun fahdini. Oh Allah, I'm lost. I'm bewildered. So guide me. The Prophet ﷺ taught us a dua, Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt. Oh Allah, guide us amongst the people you have guided. Allah taught us in the Quran, every day in every prayer, ihdina sirat al mustaqim. Guide us upon the straight path. My dear brothers and sisters, somebody who is reciting the na'at of the Prophet ﷺ, but that person's personal state is not good, is not healthy is not beautified and adorned. That person's behavior with other people in his own house is not good. With his parents, siblings, with his friends is not good. The person who is living a double standard life, showing a religious face to the world and living 
a Dubai life behind the scenes. But the, you know, the musibah now is that that Dubai life is no longer behind the scenes. The people of religion, reciters of Quran, Nats and Nasheeds, they've brought it to the forefront. They've brought it to the forefront. And you know, from the most scariest of things that I had, and it's not just hearsay, these are confirmed cases. You know, these people, the shahwa of fame strikes their head and this Bollywood and Hollywood culture strikes their head so bad. I'm not even joking. There's people who go to Madinatul Munawwara, the city of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alihi wa Sallam. And you know what they do? They hire out supercars, Ferraris, Bentleys, all of these really fast cars, and they rip them up and down the motorways in Madinatul Munawwara. You think it's easy for me to say that? The city in which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is resting. The city in which we should raise our voices. We should be careful with our breaths. And people bombing down, up and down the motorways with Ferraris because they've got money to throw and fame to show on the camera. Where has our haya gone? Allama Iqbal, the great lover of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he never went to Madinatul Munawwara. He said, who am I to go to Madinatul Munawwara? He said, the only way I can go to Madinatul Munawwara is if I die and I'm buried and the dust of my, from above my grave is picked up by a breeze that comes from Medina and takes it to Medina. He said, no other way I can go except this way. People of adab, people of love, people of honor, people of respect for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Sayyiduna Bilal left Madinatul Munawwara. Why did he leave Madinatul Munawwara? He said, I can't bear living in the city where I can't see the Prophet Sallallahu People who go to Madinatul Munawwara, they have, and, and I love with the Prophet Sallallahu they break down in tears and say, Messenger of Allah, I came to you in seeking, seeking you as my interceder before Allah. But Ya Rasulullah, you have left this world. And they cry their eyes out before the Messenger of Allah. And what do we have? A new generation of Naat and Nasheed artists going to Madinatul Munawwara, chilling in the hotels, chilling in the hotels, hiring out Ferraris and bombing them up and down the motorways of Madinatul Munawwara. How worse is it going to get? And people say to me, Oh, you don't need to speak about this. What do you want me to speak about then? If the younger generation of babies and kids grow up to see this, what love of the Prophet will come into their hearts? My dear brothers and sisters, we need to wake up. This is not the way of reciting nats. We take honor. In, in, in being honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be able to recite nats, to be able to describe the Prophet sallallahu to be able to call upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, to be able to juggle the, the, the emotions of our hearts in yearning towards the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. We, we find, we take it as an honor Allah favors us with. لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Allah said, Allah has favored the believing people by sending to them His noble messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ And know that the messenger of Allah is in your midst and amongst you sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. The one who recites nasheeds and recites not should be on a state whereby when he recites, it should be with the same adab as if he is in the presence of the one who is being described sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The scholars have said, if the one who is reciting nats and nasheeds in front of an audience sees, mentally sees that audience and is taken aback and doesn't see mentally and spiritually, doesn't see the one who he is describing sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
then he has he is at fault. He is at fault. I was once in Madinatul Munawwara and I met some people and they said to me about a particular person who is a beautiful Na'at reciter and from the lovers of the Prophet they said to me, do you know why he's always got his eyes closed when he's reciting? Because when, he's, when he recites, he closes his eyes and he visualizes himself in Madinatul Munawwara. I said, how beautiful, how honorable, how respectful. My dear brothers and sisters, that was the way of our predecessors. I was in the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Me and a group of my friends, we met Maulana Ghulam Ali Awkarvi rahmatullahi alayhi, who was a great scholar of hadith. And he was from the students of Muhaddisi Azam Pakistan, Maulana Sardar Ahmad Qadiri radiallahu an. And he told us, we, we were sitting with him and we said, tell us some stories that will inspire our love towards the Prophet And he told us a few things. And one of the most striking things that he told us was that he said that our teacher, the great Muhaddis, Mawlana Sardar Ahmad, Rahmatullah Ali, he fell ill and he went to a herbalist doctor, a Hakim. And the Hakim said to him, Mawlana, I need you to tell me uh, to do a urine test and so that I can see or you can tell me the color of your urine. And, and you know, that's what the herbalists probably do. And we know that there's urine tests that go on, the doctors take them, etc. He said, you know, the reply of my teacher was, he said to the Hakim, the herbalist, he said, Hakim, do you think I've got these eyes to impurify by looking towards najasa, filth? He said, don't you know, I've protected my eyes all my life. To see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in my grief. He said this illness, whether it continues and kills me, doesn't matter. But I won't impurify these eyes. Because I fear that if I impurify them, I won't see him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the state of people who recite naat. This is the state of the people who love the Messenger of Allah. Who are our role models? Who are our examples? Who are our teachers in Na'at and Nasheed? Should be the likes of Sayyidina Hassan ibn Sabit radiallahu an. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prays for him. Allahumma yidhu bi ruhul qudus. Allah support him through Jibreel alayhi salam. And when would he, when he would he write poetry and say poetry for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? When he would, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say to him, Hassan, Speak on my behalf and defend me in front of the disbelievers who are writing against me. And the Sayyidina Hassan would speak and he would say poetry against the disbelievers and in honor of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alihi wa Sallam. Who are our role models in Nasheed? Imam al-Busiri wrote the Burda. My dear brothers and sisters, my sincere advice to you is read the Burda and study it. With, with a scholar, find a scholar and say to him, please, can you teach me the burda? You'll read through the burda and you'll see how Imam al-Busiri is knocking out himself and crushing his nafs. And you think this man has lowered himself down so much in the first few chapters. Even before he starts to praise the Prophet Sallallahu he's breaking his nafs and lowering himself down. Why? Why is he doing this? Because only when we lower ourselves, break ourselves, humble ourselves, that we can say something about the majesty of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So long as we think we're something, we're not going to get nowhere. Imam Ahmad Raza, radiyallahu an, when he went to Madinatul Munawwara for the second time, he really wanted to see the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a wakefulness. He stood in the Muwajaha Sharifa all night sending salawat upon the Prophet ﷺ. He didn't see him ﷺ. He came back the next night. He did the same. He didn't see him ﷺ. Until a day came when he came to the Muwajaha Sharifa and he said, And he spoke to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he not only spoke to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he spoke to himself and he done tarbiyah of himself too he said hai ghafil wo kya jaga hai jaha panch jaate char phirte hain he said oh person who is heedless 
What's that place where five people go, but only four of them are walking? That's the graveyard. Four people be carrying their coffin and one person is lying. Five have gone, but four are walking. Allah Hazrat is saying this in a knot of the Prophet ﷺ. Why? Because the knot of the Prophet ﷺ is not detached from the Akhirah. We have to remember that the Prophet, we have to become people of the Akhirah. And he still didn't see the Prophet ﷺ until when? Until he broke himself down to the lowest of the lowest degrees. And he said, Teri baat koi raza? Tujh se kutte hazar hain. He said, why would anybody ask about you, O Raza? There's plenty of dogs other than you who are walking around. When he said that and he lowered himself to the lowest of the low, that's when he was able to see the beautiful countenance of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. And he wrote in his Fatawa, Al-Ataya Al-Nabawiyya Fil Fatawa Al-Ridawiyya The way he praises the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the way he lowers himself. And what does he say? He says, قال أحد قال أحد كلاب أبواب النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم. He said one of the dogs, not dog, one of the dogs of the blessed door of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم is saying, why? Because the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم's majesty is so high, so grand. Who are we to utter? Who are we to say? Like Allama Iqbal, he said, he said this is not the place. This is not the place to put your feet. This is not the place to put your feet. This is the place to walk on your head and on your eyes. Who are we to go to Madinatul Munawwara? Who are we to walk in the city of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Our teacher, the great Imam, and the teacher of our teachers, the grand teacher and the Imam of Muhaddisin, Sayyiduna Badruddin al Hassani radiallahu an, he would go to Madinatul Munawwara, stand at Babu Salam. He wouldn't go in front of the Jaliya and the Muwaja Sharifa. He would stand at Babu Salam and he would say, As salatu was salamu alayka ya jaddi ya Rasulallah. Peace be upon you, O my grandfather, O Messenger of Allah. And he would hear his answer, Wa alayka as salam yabni. And upon you be peace, O my dear son. And then he would go back. He didn't deem himself worthy enough to stand before the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam. My dear brothers and sisters, right, reciting the na'at of the Prophet وسلم, is that our honor that Allah favors us with, not something that we should boast about in the wrong way and use it to, to uh, in the wrong, uh, use it for the advantage of our worldly fame, where fame worldly financial gain, or worldly. Uh, sexualization of the mind. Astaghfirullah. I don't even want to say this word in the midst of what we're saying. But I'm just forced to be being so blunt and so abrupt now. What can I do? My dear brothers and sisters, me and you and we all, we have to serve the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have to serve his religion. We have to serve his sunnah. We have to serve his na'at. We have to serve those who recite Quran and recite Nasheed. We have to serve all of this. And one of the services that we have to do is we have to clear up this mess. We have to clear up this mess. And we have to be careful as to what the younger generation will see and what they will pick up. Uh, I saw one young lad. He was listening to uh, one person who was, who was a famous Nasheed and not artist, whatever they want to call themselves. Famous Nasheed artist, he reads Na'ats and Nasheeds. And uh, he was singing something in Arabic. And I saw a young lad listening to him and he was really excited. And when I heard it, I said to that boy, young lad, I said, what are you listening to? He said, this Nasheed artist, he's famous, he reads Na'ats, he's reading this one in Arabic. I said, switch it off. See, he's singing an Arabic song. He's moved from Na'ats and Nasheeds and now he wants to go into the, the music culture and go into uh, singing songs. Look at the respect that our people have for Arabic. That if somebody's singing a song, they'll go quiet out of respect. That's fine. It's for the, 
letters and words of the Arabic. But look at what that person has done. He's now moved his fame a step more towards the dunya and gone into the in the world of pop, in the world of... Uh, 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 and some of them become rappers. Some of them become rappers. And others of them become singers. What's going on? You know, one person, he said to me, he said, you know these people? Look, I'm not having a hit at you. What I'm saying is, I'm, what I'm saying is, the Prophet ﷺ, he is exalted, he is majestic, he is high. How would we speak to our parents? We wouldn't dream of speaking to our parents in the way some of these people are addressing the Prophet ﷺ. What's going on? Some, somebody said to me, a lot of these young people, they wouldn't be known by anybody on social media. They wouldn't gain any fame if they went purely for the dunya route. So if they try to become rappers, nobody would know them because they don't have the lyrics, they don't have the words, they don't have, and they don't have. They wouldn't become famous. They wouldn't become famous rappers, they wouldn't become famous singers. Uh, they, they wouldn't have cheer boys and girls cheering them, and fan boys and girls, and girls inboxing them and all of this. If they took the purely dunya route, because that standard's very high according to the people of the dunya. So what did they do? They thought, you know what? Let's try the Naat and Nasheed world and the Muslims will cheer us up because we're uh, apparently praising the Prophet ﷺ and then we'll get fame through that and then you know what? We'll divert it and we'll take them all with us into the world of raps. And then look at the excuse that they try to use. The excuse is, at least we're trying to bring the people to religion. My dear brothers and sisters, the religion is not in need of anybody. The religion is a high standard. We don't drag it down to the lowliness of the dunya. We don't do that. We have to rise up to the standard of the religion. And you know what happened? It will flourish. 1400 years have passed. And the beautiful standard of the Prophet ﷺ's religion is high. It's high. And people are still accepting Islam. It's the, it's the fastest gro growing religion in the world. And it's lasted for 1400 years. And it will last till the day of judgment. Guess what? Not because of me or you. But because it's Allah's promise. Don't forget that. Don't make these uh, uh, cheap excuses that we're doing raps. And we're doing all of this music. And this Hollywood and Bollywood. So that the young, they move away from music. That they, the young, they move away from clubbing and chilling and, and stuff like that. Who are you trying to fool? Who are you trying to fool? So one of the major reasons that people do this is because they know if they took the purely dunya approach, nobody want to know them. So they came into the masjids, they went onto social media, made this religious front. For And the reality behind it is is dunya. Do you get what I'm saying? And then we have people coming into masjids, making videos in empty masjids or um, be in gatherings. You see, this is another musibah that masjid committees up and down this country started to invite these people and give them the stage. Look, and you know, one of the excuses that these masjid people had is that if we do a milad sharif, for example, or a gathering, and we invite a scholar to give a khutbah, to give a talk, to give a lecture, to give a dars. Not many people will turn up. But if we call these nasheed artists, loads of people can turn up. The masjid is going to be ram-packed. Tell me, if these nasheed artists recited in a respectful, honorable, dignified way, and all of the people who were listening to that description of the Prophet ﷺ followed the sunnah of the sahaba and sat in silence, and sat in stillness. That's the description of the Sahaba. We cannot be greater lovers for the Prophet Sallallahu than his blessed family and, uh, and the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. We cannot. And if that was their state, my question is, if we are now saying, oh, we get this wajd and wajiwan, jumping up and down and all of this, 
And that's a sign of love. It's never been said about the Sahaba al Ahlul Bayt that they did these outrageous actions when they heard about the Prophet ﷺ. What we do hear is that when they heard about him after he left this world, tears wouldn't stop flowing from their eyes. Tears wouldn't stop flowing from their eyes. Where's that gone? That's the way of the Sahaba and the Ahlul Bayt. That's the way of the early predecessors of Islam. This pop culture and jump up and down and excitement and we've got wajid and we're ashiks and we're this and that. Calm down. Don't just get enraged. So these people, the mosque committee say, if we call a scholar, nobody's going to come or less people will come. But these people, they'll fill the mosque. Okay, they'll fill the mosque to what advantage? No religious advantage. It's more of an entertainment. And the masjids are not places of entertainment. The masjids are not places of entertainment, number one. The na'ats of the Prophet ﷺ are not means of entertainment. I'll give you examples. I remember when I was in Damascus and I attended the lessons of the muhaddis of Sham, Sheikh Nuruddin Itar, rahmatullah Ali. Can you believe? He was one of the greatest scholars of hadith on this planet in his time. And there used to be about 10 students sitting around him. That's it. He never gave up on his teaching. The mas masjid committee never said, oh, let's bring in an ashid group instead of the sheikh teaching. No. But you know those 10 who sat with him, they became the giant scholars of this world. Sheikh Abdul Razak al-Halabi, I saw with my own eyes. 10 to 15 people would be sitting with him between Maghrib and Isha. But they became the great giants of this ummah. It's not about bringing in. Of course, we have to bring people in with hikmah, with wisdom. But not for entertainment. Not for entertainment. This, this uh, culture of just throwing money on top of people whilst they're reciting nuts. Where's the adab of those words? You want to gift a person? Gift them in an honorable, dignified way. Don't bring this uh, culture of songs and Bollywood and Hollywood into what you're doing. My dear brothers and sisters, we have to really, really wake up to what's going on. Seriously, we have to wake up to this culture uh, of throwing money on people. Now, look, this young person who's reading Nats and Nasheed, money and money and money. He goes from gathering to gathering, people chucking money on him left, right and centre. You tell me, are you telling me that his mind is not going to be infatuated by wealth, by the dunya? Obviously. So from his naat, he becomes a dunyawi person, a person of the dunya material because of the way people are treating that person. Give that person respect. Give them a gift that befits them, whatever it be, even if it's money, but give them in a respectful way. But then also, we have to be careful that we don't overdo things. You know, Imam al-Shafi'i radiallahu anh, he went to Yemen to teach the people, and the people of Yemen gave him loads of gifts. They gave him loads of gifts. When he came back to his mother, and he told his mother, he said, mother, I went to teach the people of Yemen and they gave me loads and loads of gifts. His mother said, and what did you do with them? He said, mother, I distributed all of them back to the people. You know what she said? She said, son, had you come back with any of those gifts, I wouldn't have allowed you back into the house. You know what that's called? It's called terbiya. That's called terbiya. That's called somebody on top of your head. These kids who have been giving, are given money, given open access to accounts of girls on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, WhatsApp, uh, exchanging of numbers. Who's on top of their heads? Who's watching over them? Who's got their reins in their hands and controlling them? Other than the shaitan and their shahawat and their peers around them and their cheerleaders, whether they are mosque committees or whether they are scholars. 
Um, I have to say it the way it is. Some scholars, they didn't want to put efforts in themselves in sitting and teaching, even if a few are sitting. You turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah is the one who, uh, who, who, who gives the message. Allah is the one who places barakah. Allah is the one who creates the effect. Allah does that. We heard from our teachers, uh, Shaykh Hussain al-Khattab rahmatullahi alayhi, the teacher of my teacher and the Shaykh al-Qurra of Damascus. The scholars said that he would give dars in his masjid and only one person would be sitting and he would teach. And Shaykh Hussain al-Khattab now, his sanad has reached all corners of the earth. Only one student sat with him. Our teacher Shaykh Saleh Farfur al-Hassani radiallahu an, he studied Hanafi fiqh with Shaykh Saleh al-Aqqad. When the lesson started, there was 40 students. By the end of it, there was only one student. That's Shaykh Saleh. And what did the teacher say to him? Yakfi Salihun Salihan. One Salih is enough for the other. And how enough was he? That the knowledge of Shaykh Saleh Farfur al Hassani spread across all corners of the earth. Some scholars didn't put the effort in. They thought, you know what, let's just give up. Nobody's coming, etc. So then they saw this entertainment culture of people wanting to come just to listen to these nasheeds in this entertaining way. So they thought, we rather bring these people into the masjid than our masjids be, be empty. But the thing is, look at the amount of damage that has been caused. Look at the amount of damage. So this was lack of hikmah, lack of wisdom on the part of scholars, on the part of masjid committees, and on the part of uh, not associations and not groups. I'm not speaking about anybody in particular. I'm just saying there's lots of not organizations the question is, why didn't those not organizations ask their local scholars, can you keep these young people under your sight, give them tarbiyah? Okay, they were there to help them with promotion on Facebook and take them to different countries and sing nats. But wasn't it important that people of righteousness, piety, true love for the Prophet wasallam, and scholarly people were on top of their heads? to teach them, to make sure that they don't go out of line. Look, we're living in a very dangerous world. People are going off track day in and day out. We ask Allah for hidayah for ourselves and for all of them. But you know the worst of things is when the people of the religion, they mix between the dunya and the religion and they give this cocktail type of thing. You know, people are most disgusted with that. You know, somebody, somebody's a chiller, People will say, Allah give him hidayah, Allah, you know, open up his mind, open up his heart and bring him to hidayah. Fine. But you know the person who's in the religious field and wants, uh, wants to be a wannabe gangster, wants to be a wannabe chiller, wants to be a wannabe druggie, wants to be a wannabe clubber, wants to be a, 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 a wannabe whatever. That's what people despise of the most and are disgusted of the most. Now I'm going to ask you a question. If people despise that person more than the one who is just in the dunya, then doesn't that give us an indication of how despised that person is by Allah and His Messenger wasallam? People are despised because they don't like this, that people are mixing between the deen and, and this culture of the dunya. You think the Prophet wasallam is happy with that? You think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is happy that a people who are mentioning the name of his beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in these, in these ways of dancing like Bollywood stars and, and in their nighttime pajamas, some of them showing their aura in, in astaghfirullah wa uh, whilst they are having baths and showers and people are making videos of them, driving Ferraris and you know with, with the blue line. And now some of the gangsters selling drugs up and down, they be blasting those quote-unquote nasheeds because they've got the blue line in there and it just sounds like uh, a Bollywood uh, song. So for them, it's like, you know what? Uh, this is going to justify and save me because at least I'm listening to not, bro. How's that going to save you? How's that going to save you? My dear brothers and sisters, we really need to wake up to what's going on. اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم
And one of the cultures in the past two decades that has really prevailed in the UK is so many uh, Nath singers and Nasheed artists coming from abroad into England and up and down the country. All they do is from one mosque to the other, one mosque to the other, and just fill their pockets, fill their pockets. They set how much they want and they come for like in a gathering, they'll come for 10, 15 minutes, do their bit and then driving to the next city and then the next city and the next city. Why? Just to earn. Like, weren't there ashiks in your country where you've come from who could have listened to your nasheeds and nuts? Why is it that you prefer coming to the UK? They created this culture of money, right? When I was a kid, I remember in the gatherings, we didn't have people coming from abroad and singing not. We used to have the local people, the local Aji Saabs and the Hafiz of the Quran and people with beautiful voices. They used to recite not. And you could feel a sense of serenity. You could feel a sense of, of, of love for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You used to see in people's eyes tears used to see uplifting states within them, used to see them wanting to rush to Medina. But these people, they came, and all it was about was uh, uh, is 500 pounds. I remember once I rang one person, we wanted to invite a particular person, and he said to me at the end, uh, Don't forget that his khidma will be a thousand pound. A thousand pound? You know how long the guy's going to recite for? Like 20 minutes. Now you're going to say to me, but he made that fame, he made that name. Yeah, that's fine. He made his name and he made his fame. But the destruction that he done to this genre of Na'at, he will be accountable before the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He made his name and he made his fame for the dunya. What did he do for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? That's the question. They come and disrupt gatherings. And then if there's a scholar speaking, they'll say to the state secretary or the committee people, get him off, I, I want to go first. Or I, I want to go quick, I have to recite and go somewhere else. Num number one, and this money throwing culture, they'll say to one of the people who comes with them, oh, you know what, you may as well start it off, I'll give you like 10, 15 pound, you start throwing it on me and just enrage the people so everybody just comes and throws money at me. What about listening to what's being recited? And then uh, the, the nuts that they are reciting, some of them are remixes of Bollywood songs that they are fitting for the Prophet ﷺ. Ya Habibi, what are you doing? The Prophet ﷺ, we should be using the most dignified, the most honorable, the most respectful, the most eloquent, the most uh, entrenched words in love and respect for his majesty sallallahu alaihi wasallam you're picking up bollywood songs and words and lyrics and you're fitting them on for a naat for the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam these people rinsed our community up and down the country up and down the country this is what they did how many of them promoted the adab of naat how many of them promoted the adab of Na'at. How can they do it when they don't have it themselves? How many of them taught the etiquettes of reciting Na'at? Using Bollywood voices, Bollywood lyrics, Bollywood um, body movements, and, and, and the type of clothing that they wear. It's uh, the type of clothing that they wear. It's not respectful. It's not honorable. <laughs> And then what do they do in the gatherings? The, the peer sahab who's sitting there, they'll praise that peer. This peer is sona and that peer is sona. Why? To play with the nerves, emotional nerves of the murids. So then everybody comes and drops money. Everybody. And then what they'll say is, I went to such and such a gathering and there was a peer sahab there and his murids, they were his arshiks. What did they do? They emptied their pockets. Make a competition. What are you doing? Don't destroy our masjids. Don't destroy the genre of Na'at. 
My dear brothers and sisters, there's young university students who've said to me, said, you know, when you were in uni and people in the ISAC or in the, Nama, uh, in the prayer hall, they ask us what mosques we go to. These young people from the Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah, they say we're shy to say what mosques we pray at because then those people will say to us, yeah, you're the ones, you, you, you go to the mosque where the Bollywood lyrics are rolling deep and, and, the, and the Hollywood stars turn up in their expensive cars. They said, we feel ashamed to say what mosques we're associated to because of what goes on in our mosques. And this is why we are losing people from the Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah because of our own actions. And then some people don't want me to address this. Why? This is another way that people are leaving the Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah. And then they are being bereft of all type of love for the Prophet Sallallahu because of how people from within our own selves destroyed this genre of how to recite a nat, how to recite a nasheed, and how to even recite the Quran. People used to recite the Quran in a dignified manner, in humility and humbleness. The Prophet Sallallahu said, recite it whilst you're crying. If you can't cry, then force yourselves to cry. Reciting it in maqamat and stretching the muds. Stretching the mud beyond uh, the, the rules of tajweed. Why? Just to enrage people's emotions. And then this concert mode of men and women cheering and shouting and whistling. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he praised the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in the Quran. And he said, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكْ and we have raised for you your remembrance. Nobody after that can praise him وسلم, to raise him. He's been raised. He is the raised one. Like the poet said, Ma in madahtu Muhammadan bi maqalati walakin madahtu maqalati bi Muhammadi. I'm not praising Muhammad وسلم, with my words, but rather I'm raising my words through the praise of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa My dear brothers and sisters, the world will see the raised, elevated, lofty rank and status of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa because Allah has decided that. If Allah, if we want to serve the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa we should serve him as if the way the Sahaba served his noble person sallallahu alayhi wa that's how we should serve him now. The scholars of hadith have said, when you sit in a gathering of hadith or recite hadith, then you should be in that state. And these states are overwhelming. That anybody who has this state once, the ecstasy and the intoxication of these states never leaves that person. So our teacher, Sheikh Saleh Farfur al-Hassani, radiyallahu anhi, said, Ahyana hubbuka ya mukhtaru ahyana wa asbah al-haflu min dhikraka nashwana. He said, your love, O mukhtar, has given us life. It's given us life. Wa asbah al-haflu min dhikraka nashwana. And the gathering has been intoxicated through your love. He said, مَهْمَا كَتَمْتُ لَذَا شَوْقٍ يُؤَرِّقُنِي قَدْ يَفْضَحُ الْقَلْبَ دَمْعُ الْعَيْنِ أَحْيَانًا He said, however much I try to hide this burning, yearning love that I have for you, O Messenger of Allah, صلى الله عليه وسلم, sometimes my eye, I, the tears of my eyes, expose the story of my heart. He said, لَوْ أَمْلِكُ الطَّرْفَ مَا أَسْلَبْتُ قَطْرَةَ مَا he said, if I, had, if I had power over my tears, I wouldn't let a single drop to be released so that the story of my heart is not exposed. He said, but what can I do? O oh, Messenger of Allah, the tears of my eyes are like the gushing waves of an ocean. They are overwhelming. He said, يَهُزُّنِي طَرَبًا ذِكْرَاكُمُ أَبَدًا he said, out of happiness and joy and love, your, your remembrance, 
makes me move this way and makes me move that way, the way the early morning breeze moves the strong branches of the tree. This is, the, this is how the breeze of Medina moves my heart. My dear brothers and sisters, these were the lovers of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallam. My dear brothers and sisters, we know the story of Sayyiduna Pir Mehr Ali Shah Saab radiallahu an when he was traveling in Wadi Hamra and he missed the four sunnahs of Asr and he slept and he saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said to him, my dear son, you forgot us? You know what this means? It means that this man, Pir Mehr Ali Shah Saab radiallahu an, he had somebody above him. He was connected to somebody. A true connection to the Prophet ﷺ. And what did he say then? Subhanallah, ma ajmalaka, ma ahsanaka, ma akmalaka. Kitte mehre ali, kitte teri sana, ustaakh akiyan, kitte jari. He said, wow, subhanallah, how beautiful, how perfect, how amazing. Kitte mehre ali, kitte teri sana. Who, where is mehre ali? What am I? And where is your lofty praisal? And where have my disrespectful eyes fallen upon? He called his eyes disrespectful for even having seen the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And how are Nats recited now? It's as if the people every night have dreams of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One day, Imam Ahmad Rida radiallahu anhu was sitting in a gathering and somebody was reciting a na'at and the man was saying that how he saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in a dream. The great Imam walked and sat in front of him in great adab. And the man said, what are you doing, O oh, great Imam? He said, you just said that you see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He said, I was just reciting these words. I don't actually see him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he spoke against poets in the Quran who don't have faith and who don't have good actions. Allah spoke about them in Surah Al-Shu'ara. Allah said, وَالشُّعَرَاءُ يَتَّبِعُهُمُ الْغَاوُونَ Allah spoke against the poets who don't have good faith. They don't have faith and they don't have good actions. My dear brothers and sisters, this is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When, uh, uh, when I was a young kid, we had a neighbor a very beautiful Haji Saab. And I used to go to the masjid often with him. And he used to say to me, he used to say to me, you know, in the masjid, if they don't give me the speaker to read a naat, because this is a competition also, when it's time for Mustafa Jani Rahmat, everybody wants to jump to the mic and not give anybody else a chance. He said, if they don't want to give me the mic, it doesn't matter. He said, every morning I pray my fajr and after my fajr, I sit and recite nasheed to the naat to the Prophet and our wall and their wall was joint. And believe me, you, every single morning we used to hear them from our house reading naat. And one of the beautiful naat he used to recite was Tayba ki hayad aayi ab ashk bahane do He said the memory of Tayba has come to me. Let me shed my tears. He, every morning we used to hear him recite that. A true lover of the Prophet ﷺ doesn't need an audience, doesn't need fame, doesn't need wealth. Wherever he be, he be in a state of love. Not to say reciting in front of an audience is incorrect, but it has to be recited with the correct adab, with the correct etiquette, with the correct mannerism. And we have to fear for ourselves. Look, if we have young children and they hit a big stage of fame, we have to be extra worried about them. We have to be extra cautious for them and not just give them free reign and let them do whatever they want. That's why we will end up in destruction. Uh, we know that the great Imam Ahmad Rida radiallahu an, when he went to Medina al Munawwara, and a thorn went into his foot. What did he do? He pulled it out, he kissed it, and then he stuck it in his chest. He said, my foot is not your place. 
but my heart is. This was the love and respect that they had for Medina al Munawwara and the Prophet Sallallahu And he, he wrote hundreds of na'ats. Hadaiqi Bakhshis is filled with na'ats of the Prophet Sallallahu And you know, one of the most beautiful of his na'ats in Arabic is actually in the khutbah of, um, of, of his fatawa. What does he say? He says, وَالصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَى الْإِمَامِ الْأَعْظَمِ لِلْرُسُلِ الْكِرَامِ مَالِكِي وَشَافِعِي أَحْمَدِ الْكِرَامِ يَقُولُ الْحُسْنُ بِلَا تَوَقُّفٍ مُحَمَّدٍ الْحَسَنُ أَبُو يوسف. When I was in Syria, I used to recite this to my teachers and they used to be gobsmacked. They used to be, wow! What does it mean? He said, وَالصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَى الْإِمَامِ الْأَعْظَمِ لِلْرُسُلِ الْكِرَامِ And he said, peace and blessings be upon the leader, the greatest leader of all of the noble messengers. Maliki, he is my owner. Shafi'i, he is my interceder. Ahmad al-Kiram, he is the noble Ahmad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Listen to what he says next. Yaqulu al-husnu bila tawakkufin. He said, beauty spoke out without hesitation. And what did beauty say? Muhammad al Hasanu Abu Yusuf. He said, Muhammad the beautiful is the father of Yusuf. Allahu Akbar. And the, and, and the uh, the people of fiqh and the students of fiqh should understand from this bara'atu istihlal that he is bringing in the book of fiqh by mentioning the four imams and then the students of Imam Abu Hanifa, Muhammad al-Hasan and Abu Yusuf. But how did he place it? That Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa the beautiful, he is the father of Yusuf alayhi salam in beauty. These were the lovers of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa These should be our teachers in na'ats. These should be our teachers and imams in how to recite Naat and even how to write Naat. And you know the states that they were in. For example, Allah Hazrat said, Main mujrim hu aqa. Main mujrim hu aqa. Uh, Main mujrim hu aqa. Mujhe saath le lo. Ke ja baja raste mein hai thane wale. He said, Oh my, my master, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm a mujrim. I'm a sinner. I'm a criminal. And you know when they would say this, it's not just... Uh, it's not just uh, entertaining the tongue. It's not just a chaska of the tongue. When these great imams say, I am a, a criminal, oh my, uh, my, oh, oh, oh my leader, oh my owner, oh my master, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They actually meant that. And then what did he say next? He said, take me with you because in the pathway, the police are standing. Who are they? The angels. So what is he thinking? That I've got crimes. I need to turn back to the Prophet Sallallahu So my dear brothers and sisters, we need to rectify. We all need to recite nats, but we need to do it with the right adab. We need to teach the right adab to our children. And we have to make sure that our children are not watching this new generation of culture of not being recited in Bollywood and Hollywood uh, lyrics and styles. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, don't recite the Quran in the, in the tunes and the voices of the Fusaq. I remember once I was in a gathering in Syria and the great Allama and uh, uh, reciter of the Quran and the Hafiz of the Quran and the Jami' of the Qira'at and one of the greatest scholars of the Quran, as Sayyid as Shaykh Muhammad Sukkar, al Rifai Rahmatullah Ali, he was present. And one of the people who is reciting the verse, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This person was reciting it before he was going to recite a nasheed. And he was reciting it as if he's singing it like a song or a nasheed. And the shaykh, his face went rank, red and he became angry. He said, don't recite the Quran as if it is a song. Why? Because there's a particular way of reciting the Quran. There's a particular style of reciting the Quran. And that's not the style of nasheeds. And that's not the styles of not. It's very, very particular, and people shouldn't come out of that. And you know, there's another culture that's coming up, is that these people who are unfortunately living these double lives, what they do is they say to people, look, uh, they say to people, I'm splitting between my Nath and Nasheed life 
and my singing culture, my, my, my singing and Hollywood and Bollywood life. So sometimes I'll do this, but sometimes I'll come back to this. What are you doing? We don't need this. The religion doesn't need this. And then when Ramadan comes, they'll say, you know what? We're making Tawbah, we become religious. Why are they doing it? Because they know they'll get fame. They know during the month of Ramadan, they'll get likes and shares and people watching them. They'll get views. But straight after Ramadan, that's it. Back to Hollywood and Bollywood. Don't, use the, don't be an opportunist with this religion. This religion is sacred. Dignify and honor its sanctuary. Don't belittle it. Don't put it down. Magnify it. If you can't, then don't engage with it. Don't do what's going on now. My dear brothers and sisters, the final message is the Islam that we have inherited from our teachers and the legacy that we have taken from our rightly guided teachers, whether they are the scholars of Pakistan or they, they, they are the scholars of Asham, wherever they are from, it doesn't matter where they're from. We shouldn't belittle scholarship because of a particular nation. Scholarship is scholarship. If it comes with piety and righteousness, then we take it. The true righteous scholars of India and Pakistan, the true righteous scholars of Sham and Yemen, the true righteous scholars of, uh, of Malaysia and Indonesia, the true righteous scholars of Turkey and Egypt, they do not follow this way. They follow the way of Quran and Sunnah and the adab that are taught to us by the predecessors of this ummah of how to recite Naat, how to recite Nasheed, how to be humble and show humility when reciting the Quran, the words of Allah, how to show humility and humbleness when praising Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. This is the way we need to return back to. All of this pop star and Hollywood and Bollywood and uh, rap uh, uh, styles and, you know, and the shahwa of wealth and the shahwa of dunya and fame and women, all of this, we need to make tawbah from it. And we need to make a big tawbah if we're mixing that with our religious lives. You know, those of them who don't have, those people who don't have a religious life, you still have hope for them that one day, inshallah, Allah will give them hidayah and come back to religion. These people who have mixed up religion altogether, you know, the day that they lose fame, they're not going to be religious at all. The day that people give up on them or they're exposed and they don't know where to put their faces because of their wrongdoings, they won't be anywhere near this religion. So we have to go. This is the series on the... Every Friday we have this series on returning back to the Quran and Sunnah. The Quran and Sunnah. The Kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the words of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. وَسَلَامٌ عَلَى الْمُرْسَلِينَ وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Before we all leave, my dear brothers and sisters, my request is that we all make dua for all of the people who are ill in our community and all of those brothers and sisters who have requested for their parents, elderly parents, for their uncles and aunts and whoever is ill, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them shifa and afiyah. Allah gives them shifa and afiyah. Allah gives them shifa and afiyah. Allah gives them cure and well-being. And we pray for the Muslims in the world. Allah gives them relief and ease. Ya Rabbil Alameen wa Ya Arhamar Rahimeen. Allah brings uh, his mercy to Sham and Yemen, has mercy upon the Muslims in China and in Burma. My dear brothers and sisters, this ummah is burning. And we are in a very, very bad state. Whilst we're in this state worldwide, how can we be taking advantage of the religion in such a lowly way? We should be thinking, is this punish... Is, is this punishment that's descending upon the ummah because of my wrongdoings? You know those personal wrongdoings that we have with, with, between ourselves? There's big hope and they, they'll be forgiven. But when we're messing about with Allah's religion, what hope is left for us? When we're taking a challenge up with Allah, what, ho what hope is left for us? When we're taking a challenge up with the Prophet ﷺ, what hope's left for us? 
when we're taking a challenge with the righteous and the awliya and the true righteous ulama and the lovers of the Prophet and taking up their way, what hope is left for us? My dear brothers and sisters, we need to fix up. We need to find guides and teachers and sit with them and learn from them. And we need to fulfill our obligat uh, uh, obligations. We need to respect our parents. We need to honor uh, the, the ulama of this ummah. We need to return back and learn na'ats and nasheeds from the true lovers of the Prophet ﷺ. You know, if somebody asks me, who do you take nahu from? I say, Ajurmiya, Ibn Aqil, Ibn Malik. If they say, who do you take fiqh from? You say, Imam al-Shurmbulali, Imam al-Quduri, Imam al marghainani Imam Ibn Abidin. If they say, who do you take uh, tafsir from? You say, Qurtubi, you say, Jalalain. If they say, who, you, who do you take uh, uh, usul from? You say, Alauddin Haskafi, Imam al-Shashi. Uh, and and the, the, these great scholars, at Taftazani and others. Who do you take aqidah from? You take it from uh, Imam al-Laqani, you, you take it from Imam, Imam al-Taftazani, you take it from these great giants. The question is, ask the Nasheed people and not people, who have you taken knots from? Um, just watch some people here and there. Take it from Imam Ahmad Raza, take it from Pir Mer Ali Shah Sahib, take it from Sayyid Kifayat Ali Shah Sahib Kafi, take it from these giants of this Ummah, Allama Iqbal, and others who were drowned in Muhammadan love. Imam al-Busiri, Imam al-Jami, Imam al-Rumi. Don't, uh, don't use the lines of Rumi for the shahwa of the dunya. There's a lot of people out there, it's unfortunate, who use the kalam of Imam al-Rumi for their own desires, as if Imam al-Rumi was speaking to some girl. How will people justify that in front of Imam al-Rumi on the Day of Judgment when he says, why are we using my lines which I was using was saying for Allah and his messenger وسلم, and the righteous of this ummah, you were using for, the, for girls. And finally, the last word I'm going to say is, my dear brothers and sisters, if you are following these people and if you are friends with these people who are following this criteria there's no need to name people we're giving a criteria just work it out yourselves if you are following or friends with these people who match this criterion right my sincere advice to you is give them nasiha maybe they should listen to this lecture and many other lectures that the uh, scholars have given i'm not saying i'm the first and i hope i'm not the last and I hope Nasiha continues in this Ummah till the Day of Judgment. Give Nasiha to them. And if they don't rectify their ways, don't promote them. And finally, after this lecture, don't start doing posts promoting them as if you don't give a damn about what's just been said after you've listened to everything or somebody sent it to you. Because that is absolute arrogance. And we should be wary and careful of not becoming arrogant. What I've said is from Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam and from the words of the righteous and the ulama and the awliya of this ummah. If, if something was wrong that was said, then I should be rectified. It should be clarified to me. And I won't be Inshallah, I won't be arrogant in saying I was wrong. Because the religion doesn't belong to me or my dad. It belongs to the Prophet ﷺ. And I shouldn't become so arrogant, I think, that I'm above everybody and everything. No. Like Allah Hazrat said, Teri baat koi kyun puche raza? Why should anybody ask about you? Tujh se kutte hazar pherte hain. There's so many dogs other than you going around. If anybody says our names or speaks about us, it's not because of us, we're nobodies. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honors people, Allah raises people, Allah gives izzah to people. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He not make this izzah and this honor of Islam, Iman, and connection onto the Prophet. Allah not make it uh, go against us. And that it stand for us in this world and on the day of judgment. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.